thank you for being with us. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to jump in with just to understand who you are. So give us a few sentences. <laughs> Some people may have heard your name before because you've done this a, a time or two, but yeah. who is Mike Collier? Well, I think the only thing I've ever really done well is march in the Longhorn Band many years ago and play trumpet and everything's been downhill from since. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I, uh, I'm just like everybody else in Texas. I mean, I went to UT, raised family, married my college sweetheart, um, and uh, have made a living in the energy industry on the accounting side of things. And I love Texas and I'm very worried like so many other people in terms of what's happening uh, in our democracy. And I've always felt like if you, uh, the, the politics would work a lot better if folks had a skill they learned in the private sector, offer it up to the public good, work hard, be honest, don't stay too long. Uh, and that's really what, what this is all about. But you know, I, the most important thing to me is my family and I have two sons and I um, have a daughter-in-law and uh, uh, that's very important. But they all love Texas, we all love Texas. You ran unsuccessfully uh, once before. Why is now the right time to do this again? Well, we came very close uh, in 2018. So this is the second time that I've run for lieutenant governor, the second time that I've run against the incumbent. Uh, and we, became, we came very close. Uh, and we found as we were campaigning that Texans were very responsive to my message. And we felt like uh, if we just had more time uh, and more money, we could be successful. We were gaining on them right up uh, to, the, to election day. And what I found as I traveled the state is that if you talk to folks about the real issues, the problems that we have in the state, you know, such as the grid, for example, such as permanent funding for public education, such as property taxes, all of these things we can talk about if you like. But if you talk to Texans about the problems we face, and if you have a point of view as to how do we solve them, and that's what I do in my business life is solve problems, uh, then folks listen and they stop thinking of it as a partisan, you know, smash up and they think of it as, well, let's, which one of these two people are we going to hire to help us solve these problems? You just laid out a few problems. If you had to pick the two biggest problems facing the state of Texas right now, what are they and how do you fix them? Well, we absolutely have to fix the grid. There's no question about it. I had been concerned about the grid because it was designed improperly many years ago. And we all know that the state was outgrowing it. And so we were having less and less backup reserves. And we all knew that we would soon be in a situation where it couldn't keep up on a hot summer day. I didn't realize that we had a problem in the winter too. We've been ignoring that. So we have to do two things fundamentally. Uh, change the incentive structure so that companies invest in backup generation. We need extra generation so that we can meet the demand on a hot day in the summer. And then we have to winterize. Not just winterize the electrical gear, but we have to winterize gas production. So it seems simple. That's not hard. However, what's hard is the political will to do that because we're talking about billions of dollars. And then finally, when we do do those things, we have to make sure who pays for it, it has to be fair. And so it can't all land on consumers. It has to be shared equally by those that consume power, including the commercial and industrial users. That's one problem. What right. do you think is the second biggest problem? Well, property taxes. You can't talk about property taxes without talking about public schools, and you can't talk about public schools without talking about property taxes because the two are inextricably linked. We do not have enough funding for our public education, but we're also paying property taxes that are too high and it's unfair. I campaigned hard on that in 2018, and I know why the problem is. The problem is that the state is not doing its job. The state is deliberately putting the cost of education onto homeowners' backs and small businesses. We're paying more, the state is paying less, and therefore, we get increasing property tax bills, but we don't see any improvement in terms of funding in education. And so there's a real lack of fairness in our tax system. And remember, I'm a CPA. I mean, I am an auditor. I get lied to for a living. So I know how these pieces fit together. And a big part of my campaign is like, let's be honest, let's be transparent, let's make it fair. And we will at the same time solve the property tax problem and solve the public education funding problem. You just talked about schools. Uh, in the last week here in Texas, we have had two school shootings, one in Mansfield, one in Houston. How do you address keeping not only school kids, but the general public safe from gun violence while still respecting the Second Amendment in a state where that is so important? Right. Well, I think the Second Amendment's important to everybody. All the amendments are important to everybody, and they ought to be. And first of all, what happened today just breaks my heart. And uh, it, it's, it echoes back to a really tragic and horrible situation that happened at Santa Fe. I met one of the mothers of one of the victims in uh, Santa Fe, Rhonda Hart. 
I promised her, I looked her in the eye and I said, if I'm ever Lieutenant Governor, we will make this a priority. And there's a lot that we have to do. First of all, where did that young person get that gun? Now, do we have laws so that you're responsible with your gun? I mean, owning a gun is a right. Owning a gun is also a responsibility. So how did that young person get that gun? Why did they not know that he had that gun? And there's so many other things. What's the psychological frame? Uh, there's just so many things that you'd have to do. It's not an easy problem to solve. Don't get me wrong. It's a hard problem to solve. But I ask the question, have our policymakers really done anything? I mean, they offer thoughts and prayers every time. But do they actually do anything? And so we're in a situation now where kids are worried when they go to school they're going to get shot. When I was a kid, I didn't worry about getting shot. And it just breaks my heart. And so uh, where, there's a will, where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm very dissatisfied with our leaders that they haven't done, almost haven't done anything to solve this problem. The danger is real. But we have to respect the Second Amendment, and I do. So what would you do? Well, I think we, ought to have, we need to have a background check system that works. And by the way, I get a lot of uh, good feedback from Moms to Band Action, and you might be aware of them. It's a national organization. These are mothers who are concerned about their children in schools. They've got a very good idea as to what we should do. Background check system that works, that would be huge. Red flag laws, that would be huge. There's talk of having safes so that if you have a gun, you're responsible for that gun. Keep it in a safe. And perhaps the liability should follow the gun owner, and if that makes any sense. So if you own a gun and something terrible happens with the gun that you own, perhaps you ought to be on the hook for this. So, and then there's, there's um, uh, making sure that we understand when kids come and go, we don't want to militarize. I don't agree that you harden schools and have them walk through metal detectors. Nobody wants that. You don't want to militarize our schools. But we also, you know, maybe clear backpacks, maybe more counselors, maybe more training. There's just so many things of this nature that we need to do. More psychological help. Um, they, it, all these things have to be done, and they have to be done, you know, well, and they have to be done in a thoughtful manner. And you don't, we're, we're not talking about infringing on the Second Amendment when we say these things, but these things have to happen. I want to talk to you about uh, Roe versus Wade. We have no idea what might happen with the Supreme Court uh, in the coming months, but what, in your opinion, should abortion rights look like in the state of Texas? Well, for a long time, we had something called Roe v. Wade that was a reasonable solution that we were living reasonably with as Americans. And, and many people have various points of view on the subject, obviously. Uh, it was not going to surprise you as a Democrat that I support a woman's right to choose. I think that's the right thing to do. And so Roe v. Wade laid down a framework for that. And within that framework, we lived pretty well together. I'd like to see us go back to that. I think that makes a great deal of sense. What we've seen out of the legislature is what I would call an end around, mocking the Constitution, taking away a woman's rights. You know, a woman has a right to the, be master of her own destiny, just like any man. Uh, and it's not just a Democrat thing here. This is a Texan thing. And I can tell you, I've spoken to a lot of Republican women who are very angry about what happened. So we lived with Roe v. Roe v. Wade for a long, long time. We should respect that respect the rights in the Constitution. That's my point of view. So far, there is no Democrat who has announced that they are running for governor. Uh, who would you like to see? Uh, well, so Beto and I are friends. Beto O'Rourke, the fellow from El Paso, perhaps you've heard of him. I've heard. Uh, we campaigned together uh, in 2018, in a manner of speaking. I mean, the governor and lieutenant governor are very different constitutional officers. It's not like, you know, in federal it's not like the president and then the other president, the backup president. The two are very different jobs. Uh, but I know Beto well. Uh, I think Democrats love Beto. And I'd like to see him run for governor. I don't know if he's going to or not. You'll have to ask Beto that. But I think for Democrats that are listening, I always hasten to point out that I got more votes than he did in two-thirds of the counties in the state. I did very well in rural Texas. He did very well in urban Texas. And so if we work together and compare notes, both of us have statewide campaign experience. It takes a long time to learn how to do this and build your own infrastructure and your network. So I'd really like to run with him, but I don't know who he's going to run. <laughs> uh, you drew a challenger. You've got a primary challenger in Matthew Dowd. Uh, why do you think that happened, and how are you two different? Well, I didn't. Uh, it's not the least bit surprising that I would draw a primary challenger. This is one of the most important, you know, political positions in the state, if not the country. I've been working on this, as you know, for eight years. Um, it was clear to me when I got started in 2013, because the state is so large and complex, 
It's going to take time and effort. Uh, and so I knew that when we got close, and we're now close, others would like to sail in and say, I'd like to have that job. Um, I didn't think that it would be somebody who's mostly a Republican. I'll let him answer your questions when you talk to him. But it doesn't change anything that I'm doing. The key to success is to keep doing what I've been doing for years, which is see the whole state, and which I'm doing now, go see all of my friends, and I've got thousands of them all over the state, make new friends, talk about the issues that we face as Texans, and earn people's trust and earn their vote. What did you learn from that last campaign that you are either building on or you look back and you think, that didn't work and I won't do that again? <laughs> I now know the difference between, uh, I now know the importance of having a very, very robust, skilled, professional campaign operation. So when I ran in 2018, uh, it was not uh, a robust uh, campaign operation. And I didn't really realize until it was over. And I thought, well, if I had just uh, had uh, more support, more technical support, more funding, et cetera. Uh, I served as President Biden, then Vice President Biden, senior advisor for his campaign in Texas, where I saw a world-class campaign operation up and running. And not only that, but I met many of the folks that worked on that campaign, all of whom, or many of whom, have come across to help me. It's a big, complicated state. It's hard to get your message out. You're competing against so many other concerns, and it takes a very sophisticated campaign operation to do that. This time, I have that. You say it's a sophisticated state, it's a big state. It's also an expensive state to run a statewide campaign. Uh, I, I think at this point, Dan Patrick has about $23 million. What will it take? How much will it cost to run a successful campaign oh, against him statewide? I don't know. I don't know. It'll take a lot. In the millions, I can assure you. We've already raised well over a million dollars. Uh, we're working on our second. We'll raise enough money. I don't know how much it's going to take. I'll let you ask me that question in January or February. I'll have a much more uh, data-driven answer. But I will say this. I don't have to keep up with the Dan Patrick dollar for dollar. And we saw that in 2018. He had 10 times the money that I had. And I still came within 4.8 points. When you have somebody well-known like Dan Patrick, and everybody knows him, either like him or they don't, then I don't think his spending is going to change how people feel about him. My spending is really meant to introduce myself to Texans. There are a lot of Texans that want something very, very different in government, but they also have to know who they're voting for. It's, it's wrong to say that people will vote against somebody because they don't like them. They'll stop and think, but who am I voting for? So what I have to do is raise enough money to get my message out and introduce myself to fellow Texans. We're building on the work that we did in 18, uh, and so I have no doubt that we'll be able to raise the money. It's in the millions, and I'll give you a more precise answer in the spring. Everybody does internal polls. You wouldn't you wouldn't have jumped in if you didn't have some polling. What are your what what are you what are you learning from your internal polls about where things stand and where where you need to uh, improve and where you where you're doing well? Well, uh, when I ran in 2018, I, I performed very well in rural Texas because I went out and I talked about education, I talked about property taxes, I talked about hospitals closing, which is a real issue in rural Texas because we haven't expanded Medicaid. We'll have a lot to say about the grid. We didn't have much to say last time. Water infrastructure. So I'll be building on my strength in rural Texas. When you talk to rural Texans, they are not as reflexively Republican as you might think. They'll stop and listen. And if they hear that this person understands what I face and has a point of view as to how to solve it, there's votes there. So I'll have that conversation. And then I have a lot of work to do in the cities. It's the same message. Uh, it's just the cities are harder because you need more money. So we'll have a lot to say in the cities. But at the end of the day, you know, if you have a, a message that's very strong on economic security and jobs, and by the way, I'll stop and emphasize that I'm coming out of the business world to do this. And I've been in the business of creating jobs uh, for 30 years. That's, that's uh, a lieutenant governor's number one job is to be able to create jobs. But then you also get into solving the public education funding problem, solving the property tax problem, the grid, et cetera. Texans really want a lieutenant governor who will focus on the real issues and work on solving problems. They do not see that in the incumbent. And the frustration is so real and people are boiling over. You mentioned the grid. Do you believe Texas should stay independent or should we consider joining the national grid? It's a cost-benefit analysis. We'll have to look at it together. I don't know what the numbers are just yet. If we don't bolt on to the rest of the country, which we may choose to not bolt on to the rest of the country because it gives us the regulatory frame that we want, 
we then will have to build and invest in the excess capacity. In other words, if you have a blackout, you've got to have power. You can't start a power plant without power. So we either tap into the federal and take on the regulatory burden or make that investment ourselves. But it must be one or the other. Now, I don't know yet what my recommendation to my fellow Texans are because it's a very technical and complicated answer. And we have to work on that and I'll have to get elected. I doubt that I'll be able to make a recommendation prior to election day. But someone who does get elected lieutenant governor who sets the agenda for the legislature and says, all right, gang, Texans want us to fix the grid, then you have access to all of the expertise and we can make that fundamental decision, which will be a very, very important decision. I don't know what I'll recommend to the state until I've crunched the numbers. If you are elected, first day, what does Mike Collier do as lieutenant governor? Wow, that's a wonderful question. I hadn't answered that. Well, you know, the lieutenant governor, the most important thing is to set the agenda. I mean, the lieutenant governor is very powerful because the lieutenant governor has outsized influence on what is we as the legislature going to work on. And so the first thing I'll do is, I suppose, make a speech and say, this is what Texans want us to work on, and let's go to work. And it's all the things that I mentioned, property taxes, public education, health care, expand Medicaid, fix the grid. And then the lieutenant governor works with the senators to decide which subgroups will work on it in the committee process and then what experts will come in and how, how will you lay that out. You only have a short period, a couple of months. It's not going to be easy. So the most important thing is to say this is what I believe Texans have said we're going to work on and then organize the Senate to work on that. And then you hope that senators of both parties agree that that's the right agenda and then work to get. Now we're not all going to agree on how to solve the problem. There'll be fights over how do you fix the grid? How do you solve these problems? But at least, at least we'll be fighting over the right problems. That's the essence of democracy. And I have hope that when we get to the end of it, we'll find the right, we'll land in the right place for Texans. Mike Collier, thank you for your time. Thank you.